Welcome to City Arts Orlando, everyone. My name is Barbara Hartley. I'm the executive director of the Downtown Arts District. And um, we have an amazing staff. If you haven't met Ha'ani Hogan, uh, she is in the building. Ha'ani. And there she is in the back. And Kat Quas is downstairs. She's the manager of the gallery. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so we've, we've been in existence since 2000, and um, we started doing art events downtown to make it more vibrant and cool, and then this really cool guy named Rob Cowie came along <laughs> and made it even more special. Um, so we're really excited to be hosting the event tonight, and if you didn't know, it's his birthday. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's in the program, but can we sing happy birthday really quick just to embarrass them? Yeah. I'm not going to take the lead because I'm not a good singer. Anybody, anybody a singer in the house? One, two, three. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Robin. Happy birthday to you. So, so tonight is bittersweet. We're so sad to see them leave, but excited about the future. So Rob does everything with passion. I know a lot of you have worked with him. A lot of you have played with him and he has as much fun playing as he does working. Um, but we've all learned so much from him, and it's been such a pleasure. Um, I think one of the special times uh, with Rob that I remember is meeting up with him in New York City. So the staff was there for an art event, um, Art and Odd Places, which we brought here for three years, and um, he was like, hey, I'm in New York. Let's meet up. <laughs> so we did. And then he started talking about Orlando Story Club. And he said, you know, I just love this storytelling. Um, we've done it a couple times, but we need a venue. We need to do it on a regular basis and um, you know, help other charities. You know, so the money goes back into the community. So that's what I love about you, Rob. He's a community guy, talented, always doing something new. Starts with film, then goes into sports and gaming. And now, augmented reality and virtual reality. <laughs> so, pretty, pretty cool. Um, so so we, we said, yes, yes, we want Orlando Story Club. We want to keep this vision going, and we want it in downtown. Um, so we partnered with the Abbey, and we have our wonderful hosts here. So Danielle Ziss, <laughs> and Bobby Wesley. Where are you, Bobby's in the back over there? Um, it is so much fun. If you haven't come, please, please come check it out. It really does build community. Um, but you see a different side of Rob when he's storytelling. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, funny, sad, raunchy, <laughs> a, l a little bit of everything. Um, but today is all about you and your family. So the second good memory was uh, Fringe. The Fringe Festival, Orlando Story Club was at Fringe. And Rob re-proposed to Sarah in front of everyone and made him cry. <laughs> Kiss him. <laughs> so not just creative. Oh, go ahead. I, I hear some I hear the glasses. Oh. <laughs> That's so, so sweet, and, and he's a good dad, so his children are here to celebrate, and, and maybe to tell some stories of their own, so we're looking forward to hearing that, uh, but without, oh, let me tell you about City Art, so this is the Rogers Caney building, it is the oldest commercial building in downtown, and um, I grew up here in Altamont, my first art event was actually in this building in 2000. And I was like, wow, downtown is so cool. I've got to get involved. 
And um, so slowly, it took me a little while, but now I'm involved. Um, so last night we had our opening. Um, we like to work with local artists and help them to grow, help them to sell their work. Um, we brought artists to Art Basel this year. Um, it's our fourth year bringing them down there. So when people come see us, they're like, wow, Orlando has art. It's not just, you know, the theme park. So um, it's great, and it's growing, and it's a cool place to be. Dr. Phillips down the road helped out. Who's here from Dr. Phillips? A couple of people. <laughs> Scott, <laughs> Rachel. <laughs> Um, so anyways, I am going to, I'm going to let the program, the host of the roast, start the show. Thank you, Danielle Ziss. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara. Everyone, keep it going for Downtown Arts District, providing this beautiful space for us tonight. Thank you. We do not promise not to have technical difficulties. It's part of the show. <laughs> Anyway, hi. For those of you that don't know me, I am one of the hosts and producers of Orlando Story Club. And as you just heard, that was Rob's baby, his dream, that he brought to Orlando to build community. And then he promptly left it because he was too important and too busy to continue doing it. I was basically brand new to the show. I'd only spoken once. And he was like, hey, so you think you want to like do this thing? Uh, so Bobby and I were like, yeah, we do. Uh, and, you know, it's not bad that he left, because honestly, it's a lot better now that he's gone. I mean, I hate to be honest, but the audience is much bigger now that Rob's left us. No, but uh, all joking aside, <laughs> uh, I don't think I would have found my community and family in Orlando if it wasn't for Rob and Sarah. So I just want to say a heartfelt thank you before we start. Um, you're basically my storytelling dad. So... Aww. Thank you for giving me that gift of storytelling, uh, and I'm glad to be able to share it with others. All right, so let me go over some rules. We're going to roast Rob tonight, but because it's a roast, <laughs> that means everybody in this room is fair game. You may fall prey to the roasters. It might be what you're wearing, it might be something you said tonight, it could be any of these lovely people sitting up here. So there are no rules. Everyone is fair game. So that means all of us are going to be open and accepting, and we're not going to take it too seriously. Can we all agree to that? Yeah. All right, cool. Which means if you need to get another drink, don't hesitate. We still got that open bar over there, so help yourself as needed. Um, the other thing is all topics are open for discussion. So we've picked people from various parts of Robin's life, and we will be hearing from coworkers, family, next door neighbors, you name it. So without further ado, I'm going to bring up our first roaster, the longtime friend of the Cowies, William Watson. Okay, you guys stand up. Sarah and Rob stand up. Well, actually, Rob, sit down. Sarah, this is about you. So, you guys know this woman, this woman lives with him 24-7. So, <laughs> still, <laughs> yes. I forgot your dunce. Oh, okay. <laughs> she lives with the dunce. Okay. Now it's right. Oh, that does, that does fit. <laughs> so, so, you, you, you go to bed each night thinking that, well, I'm assuming, I'm making a lot of assumptions here, but you, you're waking up next or with somewhere in the house or somewhere with him? Yeah. And you know the next 24 hours are gonna be the same. <laughs> They'll be the same in the sense that you'll be with or part of that. So I just want you to know that I think you're an angel. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sweetie, we love you. So, gosh, um, I've known Rob, I was trying to remember, probably 15 years or so. Um, we do a lot of, we've done a lot of, uh, I don't know him really professionally. I know him um, just through some friends and we've done a lot of kayaking and 
And um, I've heard stories about everybody in this room. Everybody in this room, and it's true, it's true. But you know, one of the things that really attracts me to Rob is there's this element of, a lot of people interpret it as chaos <laughs> that follows him, right? It's like, a, it's like a fairy of chaos that's always with him. But I've kind of come to interpret that really as adventure because that's what he's about. He really, he's really seeking that. But to the rest of us, it's friggin' chaos. <laughs> so, you know, some people could call it reckless. And some of it's kind of a template of our relationship a little bit that We've been in situations that, that just needed more explanation and more time, but we never had it. We had bears run through our, where's Caton? Where's Caton? We had bears run through our, our campsite, and Rob was so relaxed <laughs> that he had issues responding. <laughs> That's part of that recklessness that, that we all love about him, right? So also one time... We used to go to these, it was way cool. One time we, well, we used to go to a lot of these camps, um, these musical uh, events. I'm just going to move on now. I didn't even tell the punchline of that joke. Well, there's, there's a lot of different angles to that. No, as well, no. We're getting well, serious now. Yeah, no, so, so we go camping with some really dear friends and listen to some fantastic music and just really get relaxed. And um, <clears throat> this one time Rob pulled up, we had this great spot. We were literally right next to the Suwannee River. You guys remember that? Right next to the Suwannee River. It was 20 feet away. So we're all setting everybody's tent up, and it's nice, and, and sometimes we're helping one another, and... I think ours had kind of gotten up, I think. We were already up, and we were waiting for the cowies to come in. They came in a little late. They started setting up. And Rob brought the tent, brought <laughs> all the kitchen stuff, the campfire stuff, the sleeping stuff, everything except the poles for the tent. <laughs> except minor detail. <laughs> the exchange between Robin and Sarah for the next 45 minutes. <laughs> It was truly priceless, I have to say. <laughs> oh, and then there's that time that we went down Juniper Springs. You guys know where Juniper Springs is? It's about an hour and a half. Beautiful. It's great. It's, it's just this beautiful place. It's magical. Uh, but so we have got to own the slowest record of getting down that thing. <laughs> because Rob interprets that when it's a spring. And so it's a small, narrow kind of body of water that moves along. And over time, it gets bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller. And it goes this way and that way. And Rob seems to think it's like battleship stations because his whole intent is to sink you <laughs> by ramming you with his kayak. <laughs> yeah, we, we did have a lot of fun, though. So probably the best one that I can think of that, is, that I can tell with both of our wives present. <laughs> So do y'all remember the space shuttle used to take off just right, right down, this, down, the, down the way? And, and uh, there was the, we went to the, the last, you know. Oh, my God. <laughs> I should stop now. So, so we went to the last, the very last shuttle launch. It was at night. It was beautiful. If you guys haven't ever seen a launch at night, it's amazing. It's like the sun coming up for two minutes. And then it disappears. It is truly amazing. So we got a bunch of us together. I think Wendy helped, helped us all coordinate a lot of this. And we ended up in Titusville at that McDonald's at like 5 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and it's in, I think it was in April. It's kind of cool, I think. Anyway, so we all kind of convoyed over to just past that bridge, that big bridge, to they, had, they blocked the gates off. You could only go so far. We got as close to that gate as we could get. Well, Rob and I, being Rob and I, we brought our kayaks with us. So we're thinking we're going to get a lot closer 
or at least get a different perspective. So we did. So we got in as close and, and almost parked right on the, on the water. And Rob and I get in our kayaks and we take off and it's still dark. It's still dark. It's still kind of cool and calm. You can see the sun starting to sh you know, change the shades in the sky to the east a little bit. So we got out, gosh, we kayaked out. So there's like, there's like little islands of grass about this tall off of the, off of the water. So we would kind of kind of get hidden off that back there. We probably got about a couple of hundred yards away. And I don't know how far we were from the coast, but we were clearly close enough where when that thing took off, you could feel it. And you could just sense it, you know. You felt it shaking the water a little bit. And then, and then over time, like I said, it was just like the sun coming up. And then after it popped into the atmosphere, we noticed there was this stuff in the sky, this it's just hard, to, it's really hard to describe. It was clearly part of the exhaust or whatever that comes out of those, but it was just this multicolored kind of a ring. It was really cool looking, floating through the sky and it kind of went over us a little bit. Yeah, it was, yeah we don't know what was in it, but it was very pretty, right? <laughs> and at that time, that was important to have something pretty. So we we're just kind of chilling out and I don't know what came I know what came next. I just don't know which came first. Either the mosquitoes or the police. <laughs> we weren't in Mosquito Lagoon, but we were certainly close enough. They literally covered us up. Yeah. Yeah, you, had, eaten a lot. you had to cover your orf every orifice you had <laughs> exposed. Yes, they were busy. So we were experiencing that, and then lo and behold, just like sideways from nowhere, here comes this this boat with these flashing lights and these sirens. And we're like, what the, f what is that about? And we were the only ones out there, we had no idea. So evidently we had drifted closer to the launch. Shuttle, yeah, we were way past the safety zone. <laughs> <laughs> they seem to think so. They were very upset with us. <laughs> they were like, you guys are idiots. <laughs> But I have to say, but I have to say, the afternoon got better. <laughs> so anyway, um, you just think about that, you know, that, that fairy of chaos that we all love in Rob Cowie. This is a storyteller, so I'm, I'm hoping that we'll get something from him later. I'm sure that we will, but London has no friggin' idea. <laughs> what they have coming. <laughs> Thank you, Danielle, for doing this. Man, William, I think you were confused and thought we were back at Orlando Story Club telling five-minute stories. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, so in planning for tonight and picking all of the roasters, I got a lot of feedback from Rob. We didn't take any of it, but one of his pieces of feedback was that he needed two people to start the roast because one wasn't enough, but I think William proved him wrong. So give it up again for William. <laughs> and we have a friend right here who's going to step in for a 15 second story, and I'm counting. I, I wasn't going to take part in this, but when he was talking about the camping, I'm, I'm Jim McManus. Hi. Most of you hopefully don't know me. Um, uh, <laughs> when you were talking about the uh, camping stories, Wow, I mean, I was just getting flooded, like, oh, what about this one, what about that one? The one that sums it up to me the best. <laughs> it's so, it's just so small, and it would be a moment that would be missed by a lot of people, but we had uh, been there, you know, we're going to be there four days, and we all planned, each couple was going to do breakfast each, a different day. So Friday was, I believe, you guys' turn, and Saturday, Friday, and, uh, Saturday was ours. Sunday comes, and you guys are cooking breakfast, and Sarah, I have every faith in your cooking abilities, <laughs> right? But uh, I, I said, oh, great, you guys got bacon, awesome, bacon and egg. Who's do, who doesn't like bacon and eggs? And I walk by the pan, and the whole slab of bacon is sitting there. And basically, you just pulled the wrapper open and dumped it in the pan. And I was like, I just, hey, that's, that's a, that's, that sums up Rob a little bit. I, I, I like bacon, I just don't know how to get there. But, we'll, but we figured it out together, my brother. And thank you for all the good times and the many years of figuring it out together. <laughs> And now we know why he's wearing a dunce cap, ladies and gentlemen. 
doesn't even know how to cook bacon. Sarah, what have you taught this man? <laughs> anyway, time for our next roaster, if I can get Kurt McDo up. Kurt McNew. Uh, as you see, no notes. It's all, all coming from the heart. Um, I've known Rob and Sarah for about 30 years. I met Robin through the personal ads. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was the old Florida blue sheet. He was looking for uh, people to help him with his college project. And uh, that's where it started. I met Robin on the, or Sarah on the set, too. Um, and I met a lot of great people, even uh, John. <laughs> um, and I will be sad because once they leave, I'm not going to see a lot of you people anymore. Because... He, always, he and Sarah would throw the best parties, especially New wow. Year's Eve. Those were great. And so many people. But the, when, I, when we finished his college project, I thought that was it. I'm not going to see him again. But he wanted to hang out with me. And I was like, well, me, this guy. So, and then he goes, hey, you got a van. Can you help me move? And I'm like... <laughs> Sure. So I move him out of his college dorm to Sarah's house. And then from Sarah's house to their another house. And from that house to an apartment. And from that apartment to a house. I am not joking. I lost count after 20. 20 moves. And, and again, I think for like Chantel, for every birthday, that was a move. 16 before college. Yes, see, 16 before college. So, <laughs> so I remember going to his house and he would have a pod and he would go, I think I gotta get another pod. I'm like, why? And I go, it's like, I tell him to go away. <laughs> so I go into the pod, remove everything from the pod and put it back. Now it's only half full <laughs> because the way he likes to pack is just shove it into the pod. <laughs> so, so it's like, how do you do that? He has to be the worst Tetris player ever. But the, the one that sticks out the most to me is I'm taking my wife, Kaori, to L.A. so she can go on to Japan, and I would stay. My daughter was going into her very first apartment. And for a short time, they, she was living with Robin and Sarah in their guest house. So I, I come out, since I know they're moving and my daughter's moving, I'll help everybody move. I'm really good at moving. So I, I, I have into my head, I'm going to spend all week hanging out with Robin and Sarah. No! What, is she, what does he do on the day that they have to move from their house? He goes away. He leaves. And leaves Sarah by herself with a broken foot. So... The, the house they're moving out of is literally all wood. And there's wood floors, wood paneling, wood everything. And Sarah is so concerned about the landlord finding something wrong with the house. So she is starting from that end of the house and polishing the entire house. And it was like, once it was done, don't touch it, don't touch it. He's, who knows where he is? He's out in New York having drinks with celebrities. Who knows? But this poor woman is hobbling around getting that house ready. Now she has to move it to the new house. And she has other things going on in her life. I tell her, just sit down. I've moved you many times. I know how to set your house up. I know where everything goes. So... Everything got done. Sarah was happy. I had a wonderful time, even though you weren't there. It still was a wonderful time. And, but I, I want to say the other things, be, just to be serious. These, this whole family, Les, everybody, they put me into their family. I'm Peter's godfather. I love this family so much. And I'm going to be very sad when you leave, but I'm going to be watching you guys because when we move to Japan, I'm going to use what you learned to get out so I know what to do. And the other one story I do have, 
This guy literally saved my life. We were scuba diving. I ran out of air. And he knew exactly what to do. I do this. Because the, the, the dive master said, don't go into the ship. Whatever you do, do not go down into the ship. So we get down there, we're walking around. The, the dive master comes by and he signals, go downstairs. I say, oh, okay. Rob's like, no, I'm not going to go down there. <laughs> so I go, eh, I'm going to go down. So I go down, and all of a sudden, I don't have any air. Dive master's gone. I look around, there's Rob. I do this. He does that. He grabs me, pulls me in, takes his regulator, gives us to me, does it. Everything just by the book. And he, this was his first open water dive. <laughs> he goes, are you okay? I go, I'm okay. He goes, let's go up. We're going up. The dive master comes up. He goes, what's going on? And I, and I show him my gauge. He goes, oh. And he stops Rob because the dive master keeps more air. Robin goes up. We hesitate. We go up. And dive master goes, whatever you do, don't tell the captain. <laughs> what does he do? He tells the captain. <laughs> but no, he seriously saved my life. So I thank you for that. So, thank you, Ron. I didn't know we were going to cry this early in the night. Jeez, we haven't even gotten to family yet. Speaking of, Peter, come on up. Howdy. Sorry, I learned that now that I'm living in Texas. Um, all right. So before I start, I just want to let everyone know here, everything I say, I say with love. So, hey, Dad. I'm starting to rethink this idea. Hey, Dad, it's me. The most expensive decision you ever made. On this special day, I figured that I would give you and these lovely people a little insight into my experience as the most important person in your life. <laughs> so, growing up in the Cowie household was no easy feat. <laughs> Constantly being loved and cared for really made it hard to relate <laughs> to my angst-filled friends. <laughs> I mean, you were always there for me and would do anything to help. I mean, can I just hate you a little? Like, <laughs> what the hell, Dad? <sighs> but on top of this constant praise about how awesome I am, which, trust me, I know. <laughs> you don't have to remind me every five to ten minutes we talked about this. <laughs> I also feared for my life. Every single time you released what you consider a sneeze. <laughs> and what many historians and scientists would consider an abomination. <laughs> See, breakfasts were always pretty solid. My dad really had the uh, grab random shit from the fridge and throw eggs on it, just scrambled <laughs> down. Really good at that one. <laughs> When it comes to dinner, uh, everything changed when I turned 18 and we uh, started smoking meats. <laughs> In our green egg, of course. You introduced me to the wonderful, wonderful world of filmmaking. Thanks, asshole. <laughs> I tried to talk you out of it, man. I tried to warn you. Now I have to be a starving artist and follow my passion. Thank you. You know, if you were going to get me into a film career, you could have, like, not maybe changed film history with one movie. <laughs> you know, it's just completely unfair. Like, come on, man. Like, leave some for the rest of us. Jesus. So, you and Mom have given up so many countless hours making this family probably my third favorite family. <laughs> Top ten is pretty good. 
I'd like to conclude this incredible speech by making some verbal attacks against my family. <laughs> Mom, keep kicking dad's ass. Because Lord knows he needs it. <laughs> You've given me more love than I could ever imagine possible. I love you a lot. Chantel, you are my favorite mistake that mom and dad made. <laughs> Keep being one of the strongest women I know. I love you a lot. Ian, you look like Jesus gave up and became the Lebowski. <laughs> you are the funniest man I know, and I love hanging out with you. I love you a lot. Colette and Tim, repeat after me. In, and out. Just remember, if you, if you and the kids survive long enough, maybe they can get up on stage and talk shit about, ch talk shit about you for, in front of 80 of your most closest friends and family. I love y'all a lot. Grandpa, no one tells a dick joke quite like you. <laughs> I cherish, I cherish every moment I get to be with you, and I'm extremely proud to be your grandson. And I think you're okay. Just kidding. I have permanently marked myself twice in your honor, so don't fuck this up for me. In conclusion, both of my parents are amazing, and I couldn't ask to be part of a better family. Thank you to everyone who came to be a part of this night and everyone who made this night possible. Um, you've all been a part of my parents' life in so many ways and a part of my life in a lot of ways. Good majority of you have known me since before I knew who I was. Uh, so I just want to say thank you and have a good night. We're gonna hold the mic. Man, charming just like his dad, huh? Probably the only man in here that can go from talking about dicks to saying he loves his grandpa. <laughs> and does it in style. All right, so we're gonna move back into the close friend group and let's get John Caton over here. Well, I have to say that I misread the invitation. <laughs> I thought it was a rib roast. <laughs> Turns out it's a Rob roast. So, so all these wonderful things I wrote about you. No. I gotta, I gotta hold on to it. It's a, it's a, I'll share them with you later. So now I gotta think of things to make fun of Rob about, and that's not an easy thing to do. As everybody here knows, he's one of the most wonderful people I know. He's successful professionally, but his family and his friends all remain the center of his universe. How do you make fun of a guy like that? <laughs> well, what kind of friend would I be if I didn't think of something? Now, one of the things that I really love about Rob is that he is a great storyteller. Maybe a little, all right? Maybe a little too great. Now, I've known Rob for probably 30 years, and I've heard his stories, the same ones sometimes over and over. And one of the things I noticed is each time he tells the story, 
it gets a little more grandiose. <laughs> So I'll give you an example. Now, I don't want to say that Rob's an embellisher, but he's a little bit of an embellisher. Now, this story I'd heard probably five times, and he told it again recently. We were cave spelunking, William and Robin and me, or as Rob told it, a thousand people went spelunking. <laughs> He told me a story about one night, and maybe some or most or perhaps all of you have heard this story, so I want to see some nodding if you recognize it. He w when, when he was a, ta a teen, now keep in mind, this story has had 30 years to grow. When he, was a, when he was a teen, he was invited into a cave at night, and it was pitch black, and he was with a group of people that he didn't know. And they said, hey man, if you run and jump, you'll fall into a flooded quarry. So Rob said, as Rob does, okay, great. <laughs> so feeling, it was pitch black, feeling only with his toes, he found the edge of the cliff took three steps back, ran, and jumped. Now, the first time I heard this story, he was in the air for a pretty good long time. <laughs> but the last time he told this story, he was in the air. Do you remember how long you were in the air? It's about an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're getting to that. He was in the air for five seconds. Now, if you do the math, if you fall for five seconds at 32 feet per second squared, you've fallen more than 400 feet. <laughs> now the world record holder is 193 feet. Which means that Robin Cowie holds the world record for the highest dive. Sadly, the Guinness Book of World Record wasn't there to record it, but we all know. So Rob, if we're all still friends after tonight's roast, and I hope we are, I look forward to many, many more stories, especially when we're old and gray, and you tell me about the time you jumped out of an airplane, <laughs> fell more than a mile into the ocean, swam through shark-infested waters, dove down to the bottom, grabbed the heart of the ocean, if you remember this from Titanic, and returned it to Rose, where it belongs. Rob, I love you, and I look forward to many, many more stories. All right, so we've heard from the longtime friends and we've heard from the sun. It's about time to get some coworkers up here. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. we've got Simon from EA to come up next. Don't be too nice. Oh, uh, don't be too nice, huh? I'm <laughs> <laughs> only here as a representative of EA not to be nice. I do love that this gentleman right here said, I have no notes and I speak from the heart. And um, Rob's son got up with a notes. And uh, that about says everything you need to know about Rob. Uh, but, but, <laughs> like everything I've ever done for Robin, uh, I'm going to phone this one in. So I'm just going to unlock my phone here. So, uh, yeah, uh, I think only like one person in this room knows me. And that's our friend Fern from EA. And uh, wait, wait, one other, one other, maybe, maybe one other. But um, uh, my name is Simon Scher, and uh, I I have a title uh, at EA that's a very long and distinguished. And Sarah will probably tell you it's like Rob's career. <laughs> um, but I'm called a uh, principal, technical, animation director for EA Sports. 
Yeah, for 18 years, my job's been advanced research and development, technical production, implementation, design. <laughs> so naturally, Robin needed me so he could take credit for all my work. <laughs> now, I, I would like to say I had the immense pleasure of working with Robin at EA, but I'm going to say I worked with Robin <laughs> at EA. Uh, so uh, Robin Crowley... Uh, Crowley Cowie? Cowie? Cowie, Cowie. Cowie. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Robin Cowie was the producer of a highly rated breakthrough cinematic story mode on, called Longshot. Um, it was for EA Sports' 27-year-old franchise, flagship franchise, Madden. Uh, probably one of the most like, important games we make. Uh, on Longshot, we worked side by side with Academy Award winning an Emmy award-winning talent, and uh, don't worry about it, we're gonna get there, so. Just, 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 keep your head up, buddy, keep your head up. Uh, on Longshot, we did have an incredible challenge before us, though. I mean, we were tasked with venturing into these new creative areas of games, film, storytelling, and to do that, we absolutely needed an innovator in the interactive space. We need someone who was a true visionary, unrivaled leader in his field, and somehow we hired Robin instead. <laughs> <coughs> But, uh, but I, I personally, I personally joined the Longshot team pretty late. Um, I'm kind of the guy they, they, they throw in um, to like firefight the projects that are going down. And so I, I joined it against my will. Um, <laughs> but as in theater they say the show must go on. Uh, in video games we say the game must ship. <laughs> so my job was basically about solving technical problems. And I just have to say, uh, Robin, you were one of the most incredible technical problems I faced in my career. <laughs> See, when I first met Robin, he'd, he'd never worked on a video game before. I, I, wait, wait, you know, I'm assuming that. You never, you never worked on a video game. Oh, you had, you had? Oh, oh, okay, I was, oh, sorry. Three, three, three! Oh, it's a terrible assumption, I apologize. Uh, <laughs> anyway. I was brought on to Longshot to ensure that the project finished, even if it meant prying it out of Robin's cold, dead hands. And <laughs> honestly, a very small part of me is really glad it didn't come to the dead part. <laughs> um, I do believe I speak for all of the creative directors on the project and thanking Robin for introducing us to the amazing benefits of brainstorming, inclusion, collaboration, combined with heavy day drinking. Uh, a year later, as Longshot 2 shipped and we began production on our third title together, Robin solidified our trust in one another, our faith in each other, our mutual respect, and our friendship by resigning from EA. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like, in all honesty, my wife and I RSVP this, RSVP this afternoon. I, I didn't know uh, that this was going on until I saw it because I've made really careful to, like, block Robin from my Facebook. <laughs> But I saw it, I saw it, and at first I thought it was in South Mongolia. And then I, I realized today it was South Magnolia. <laughs> so I, I just assumed that Robin was where he was during the majority of the long shot production, somewhere in South Asia, where none of us could find him. <laughs> but uh, as a technical animation director on the projects that we share credits on, uh, I didn't want to miss this opportunity to finally meet him in person. <laughs> so, uh, so. So here we are today, and I, uh, I, I actually told Ed, uh, Danielle that we RSVP'd late um, because we didn't have anything, I mean, because we, uh, we didn't see the invite, but the truth is we didn't have anything fun to do until now, so yeah, yeah, we, did, we had to find something fun to do, so. Um, but um, anyway, uh, that fell a bit short, I'm sorry. My wife warned me some of my jokes would fall flat and have, like, rough endings, and so I left them in because I thought Robin might appreciate that after producing Blair Witch Project. <laughs> wait, wait, no, no, but seriously, no, seriously, speaking of Blair Witch, um, it's, it's really, like, Robin's very famous for his highly acclaimed horror films, and a lot of us at EA could imagine Robin as that, like, fearless hero, um, but to me, he's that guy that says, I'll be right back, and is never heard from again. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I love you, man. 
<laughs> you have no idea how hard it is to do his job and how many people need your attention on a 24-7 basis. So inside joke for the entire industry. I just want to clarify so I don't get fired on Monday. Uh, but uh, it is Robin's birthday. Uh, his lovely wife Sarah, his family, children, father, are here this evening. Um, I hope that they're as happy as everyone else that he's moving on to bigger and better things in another country. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I, um, I was bullied pretty bad as a kid. And I was taught at a very young age by bullies and by my family that you should only make fun of those who you truly respect and admire. So I do want to raise a glass to the most amazing boss I've ever worked with. Sadly, Will Mozell works at Microsoft and he's not here tonight, but <laughs> I do want to raise a glass instead to Robin. He is one of the best producers I've had the honor of working with. Uh, he's an amazing innovator. He's one of the most creative people I've had the pleasure of knowing. And uh, Robin, you can squeeze blood from a stone, but if you can make a technical gem like long shot out of a piece of shit like me. <laughs> Uh, you're doing something right, man. Florida's going to be less bright without you here. And to Robin. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like this is a good time to mention that Rob looks like Colonel Sanders. And... I feel like it's a good time to mention that while I'm going to miss you so much, I'm going to miss Sarah more. So on that note, let's get some feminine energy on up here. And Deborah, come on up. Is Deborah here still? Did she get so bored she left? She's standing right next to me. Everyone, Deborah Watson. <laughs> All right, here I am. Okay, so it is a total, <laughs> it is a total testament to how much I love these people because I'm an introvert. And when they first asked me to do this, I'm like, hell no. I'm not getting up and I have a microphone anyway. But then I said, no, screw it, I'm gonna do it, right? That's what we have to do. All right, so I met Rob and Sarah through the McManuses. They're the connectors. They connect a lot of us together. Um, and I think, William, that we've known him 20 years. Because how old was Peter? Uh, twinkle in my eye, I think. No, no. So about 20, whatever. Y'all are like, whatever, who cares? Just get on with the story, will you? So, um, so in that time, there's been a lot of fodder, a lot of um, stories to tell. Uh, and this one involves his two favorite women, Sarah and Chantel. So, um, and you know that William, uh, William and I have a back porch that's, what can I say, it's, it's popular. <laughs> and so we sit there a lot and we, of course, tell stories and um, Robin is the story man. So he's always telling stories. So this particular story involves the weekend that he took Chantel to Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin. So, the mad town is what they call it. So, I don't know if y'all know this, but Sarah and Peter are, look at them, they're sitting, that's how they are. They're like two peas in a pod. And then you have Chantel, and you have Robin. <laughs> and they are like two peas in a pod. So, you have two peas in a pod, like Robin, who are in Madtown, that's what they call it, right? Madtown, it's Madison, Wisconsin. Okay, Madtown, they had to come up with something cool because it's Madison, but <laughs> they're like, cheese, we have cheese. Anyway, so he, they, he goes up, he's moving her, it's her freshman year, right? And so they get her in her housing <laughs> and they're gonna go out for dinner, they're gonna celebrate. So here comes Chantel walking, she has these big ass high heels on. I mean, platform shoes. And Robin's looking at her and he's like, are you sure you wanna wear those? She goes, yes, I have this outfit. I wanna wear this outfit. I may be embellishing a little bit, but. Um, thank you. I know my girl. And so they get in the car and they go and they celebrate and they have dinner and they have something called a fish bowl. I have no idea what the hell it is, but the jar is bigger than my head. 
when you look on Facebook, there's a picture of them. It, the, the bowl, I don't know what's in it. And then they had spotted cow beer. So it was a fun, fun evening. So they celebrate, and then, you know, Robin hangs as long as he can, but it is Chantel. It's a younger version of him. And he's like, I got to go. I got to go. And Chantel's like, well, I'm going to hang out, right? So whatever, she hangs out, and she's celebrating more, more fish bowls probably, but whatever. So the next morning, Robin goes to get her because they're going to have a dessert. He's taking her to dessert, and here comes, here comes Chantel, and she's limping. And he's like, I told you she shouldn't have worn those shoes, you know, and she's like, I oh, know, but whatever. And then Robin says he looks over, and there's this patch of green, and on the patch of green is a girl, a young girl, and she's passed out, face down, arms out, and an X on the ground. I mean, just like completely passed out. And so he's telling us a story and everything. And then he proceeds to tell us, and Sarah was there, just so you know. And um, he proceeds to tell us how Madison is a party school. And we're like, you know, university, yeah, because it's like 50 below in December, you know? I mean, they're going to drink all they can. It's insane. But anyway, so, and he's like, yeah, and the alcohol is really cheap. And we're just all waiting, you know, because uh, I'm like, this is a different take on this, you know, what, where, where does this come from? He said, yeah, I bought like three gallons of vodka for $30. <laughs> and I'm looking at him, and Sarah's got this, you know, that look she gets. And I'm like, Robin, why would you buy three gallons of vodka? And he's starting to realize that this was probably not a conversation to have with the wives around. If you remember that from earlier. And, and he said, uh, well, I got it for Chantel. And Sarah goes, what? And I go, Robin, and he's like, oh, now he's, no, he's in deep shit. So he starts like, well, you know, um, he said something about <laughs> the fact that um, uh, I told you, Sarah, and Sarah's like, I, I, I distinctly remember telling you, and Sarah's like, nah, -uh. <laughs> she's like, no way. And then he's like, well, better I buy it than somebody else, you know? And I'm like, Robin, you could at least made a challenge for her, you know, at least give her an incentive to have to figure it out herself. <laughs> and so, so then what do you think happens? I don't know if you've ever seen our Miss Sarah ass slap Robin, but she was ass slapping Robin. She does this thing where she just slaps the shit out of him. That was the, like, that was, the, I've never seen an ass slapping like that since then. <laughs> but anyway, I love you guys. Thank you. I feel so gypped. I have not seen him ass slapped. I feel like it should happen before the night's over, right? It needs to occur. Okay. I, you know. <laughs> This is why I got you this nice beer mug, so it doesn't hurt as bad. You just keep throwing them back. All right, so Wayne, the neighbor from across the street, I heard, has not known you very long, but he's ready to give up all your secrets. Come on, Wayne. Haven't known them very long. It was the big storm that brought us together. You've heard the story probably in 2017. If you need a ditch, Doug, he's the guy. We were flooding out because of the storm, and he came over and said, what's going on? And of course, he helped dig, and I appreciate that. I got to meet all his family, his friends, everybody he knew. Every time after that we went someplace, Rob, how are you? Well, I would say to my wife, Robin, how do you know these people? My wife's name is Robin, too. <laughs> so now when Sarah sends me a text and she does it, Robin said blah, blah, blah. And I'll have to respond, which Robin? <laughs> but I want to say, you were great neighbors. You got us through the storm. And we met them because their dog got loose and my wife found it for them. And um, I don't know if that was meant to be or not that we found the dog. But uh, Sarah's been great. We always see her. She always has over for dinner. And then sometimes Robin shows up and he joins us. <laughs> A lot of these stories we've heard before, but... 
they're different than the way he tells them. <laughs> like the tent one, it was told a little different. Uh, the kayak was pretty accurate, you know. And then I'm glad I didn't go diving with him after I heard your story there. But uh, we'll miss you. And um, just so in case anybody didn't know, the queen just heard that he's coming and told her husband he's now in the hospital. <laughs> so farewell. And uh, remember, we have to prove the new neighbor, so we won't let you sell the house. <laughs> a little neighborly love. <laughs> I think it's time to hear from the daughter, Chantel. <laughs> okay, so I would like to say that those three gallons of vodka I hid under my futon in my dorm room and sold them for $5 an evening to all of my new friends. So he turned me into a businesswoman and all my best friends. <laughs> I was doing good teaching our entrepreneurship. <laughs> all my best friends thought I was really, really cheap when they first met me because I was like, bring $5 in a red cup. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but hi, obviously, my name is Chantel. I like cats and long walks on the beach with my dad. <laughs> Very long. <laughs> um, so you all are here because you obviously know my parents. Um, so you know that they are the cool parents. Um, not cool in a way where they let me drink in high school. I have three summers worth of groundings to prove that. <laughs> um, but cool in a way where they take a genuine interest in my life. They're always there for me, constantly involved. <laughs> um, we have long conversations um, where they listen and they get excited about my interests and ideas. They fuel my curiosity and challenge my worldviews. They're funny and they're interesting and they have endless lessons to teach me through their stories. Um, so sometimes our conversations are so engaging that I don't know to notice how much time has passed. Um, my dad is also an eternal optimist. These are the two things that you need to know for the following to make sense. <laughs> um, so to this day, whenever we hit a beach, my dad and I like to do this thing where we walk and talk. Um, and so when I was 10, one fateful day on an island in Tampa, Florida, my dad and I decided to take one of these walks. Um, an hour or so into the walk, we looked up. <laughs> like, yeah, so we're an hour in, okay? We're an hour out. Um, we looked up from the sand in good conversation to decide whether or not we should walk back. And my dad goes, no! <laughs> we've been going for this, we've been going for so long. The island isn't that big. Surely, we can just walk around to the other side. <laughs> <laughs> because all islands are round, right? <laughs> says 10-year-old Chantel. <laughs> Geography isn't my hottest subject, so I trust my grown adult father to use his 22 years of extra experience to make the right decision. Wrong. He was very wrong. I was also wrong to trust his sense of direction, which I found out three hours later when we still had not made it back to our beach towels and family. <laughs> the awareness that my father had no clue what the fuck he was doing <laughs> developed as I was climbing through patches of thorned bushes. The beach had disappeared at this point. Crying and barefoot as we made stops for him to pick the thorns out of my feet. <laughs> only to arrive upon the end of the island. <laughs> Guess what the end of the island was? 
It wasn't the other half of a circle. <laughs> the end of the island was a mile long swim across <laughs> the deep blue body of ocean water to the other end, which my 10 year old little body was not equipped for. <laughs> The island was not round, folks. It was a crescent. <laughs> like a moon. <laughs> yes, a crescent. Smiley face. As the tears continued to fall, while I realized our fate was to either walk four hours back to where we had come from, or to attempt to swim my little body, life jacketless, across this triathlon-length lagoon of doom, <laughs> Alan Poulton and crew, yeah. thankfully, <laughs> a few minutes later, appeared on the ocean horizon like a mother whale gloriously guiding through the ocean water, finding her lost baby calf, <laughs> driving his boat towards us <laughs> in the, where we were standing in the tropical briar patch we were precariously balanced on until we could swim to safety. Um, the rest of the gang had apparently known my father well enough to know that something had run amok and <laughs> for us to be gone that long and they took to the sea to find us. These days, my dad and I stick, on an, stick to an out and back path for our beach walks. <laughs> dad, you've been my idol my entire life. I hope I don't cry. <laughs> uh, you live with passion. You take risks and seek adventure. You're constantly looking for new ways to grow, new experiences to have, and new creations to build. You love fiercely and you follow your dreams. You gave me a fantasy of a childhood filled with bedtime stories we'd make up together and words that leapt off the pages of books into my imagination through the characters you built. You filled my life with laughter and so much joy. From games in the pool like when I'd stand on your chest and water ski, to weddings where we tear up the dance floor and you throw down with a worm. <laughs> when I think about having you as my father, I think about how incredibly lucky my draw was on life. I am endlessly grateful to you for the love that you've given me and all that you've sacrificed to give me the life that I have. Happy birthday. I love you. <laughs> That's not it, though. <laughs> okay, wait, I have one more. Okay, so I know that tonight was supposed to be about roasting my dad, but it's also my parents' going away party, and I wanted to dedicate some time to my mother. So, <clears throat> it's undeniable that my dad's impact on my life would have been incomplete without the other half of this beautiful duo. Mom, the older I get, the more and more I'm blown away about the, by the life that you've created for me. When you said you didn't want to be roasted, I got excited because this presented an opportunity to take the time to do something that I don't get to do as often as I would like. To say thank you to you for everything that you've sacrificed for me. To tell you that I love you more than I can put into words. To thank you for being the best mother that I could ever have imagined. And to say that I'm so incredibly proud to call you my mom. And I'd like to tell you why. Number one. You are courageous. At the age of 18, being the youngest of seven, your parents told you to figure it out and move out. No safety net, no money for a college education, and yet you found a way to grab life by the balls and lean in. Even when things got really tough, you were brave. Cut to 20 years later, you've put yourself through college while raising two children and working to support dad's projects. You are selfless. When I say working to support dad's projects, I mean truly full-time working, doing the accounting for his projects and doing our family finances. My mom does this not because crunching numbers is a quick book, crunching numbers in QuickBooks gives her a thrill. 
<laughs> but because she's a team player. She invests herself in the partnership that her and my dad have created and in our family without asking for anything in return except for love. There is not a single memory I have of a time when my mom put herself before the needs of our family. As I get older, I realize just how hard that is to do because we're all individuals before we have families. My mom met my dad, before my mom met my dad and had my brother and I, she wasn't Sarah the mom or Sarah the wife. She was just Sarah, Sally if you will. My mom is her own person. She has desires and goals and ambitions and needs. And for the last 25 years, my mom has honored her individuality and juggled her dreams while putting our family's needs first. Number three, my mom is fun. <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you haven't had the pleasure of going to a funny movie with my mom, do yourself a favor <laughs> and set that up ASAP. <laughs> my mom's laughter is infectious. Her sense of humor runs strong. It makes funny movies more funny because she pees herself laughing at every joke. <laughs> My mom isn't afraid of what other people think. She doesn't approach life with an ego. That makes being around her really fun. Her energy creates a safe space, and I think that what, that's what makes her so easy to love. Number four. This brings me to my last and most important point. My mom is loving. My mom has so much love in her body, she might as well be a giant heart with two arms. <laughs> Every one of my friends growing up has loved my mom. Literally, always the feedback that I get. Your mom is so nice, your mom is so sweet, so kind, so warm, so inviting, so funny. <laughs> it's a privilege to have good people in your life that are such wonderful human beings that this is the constant reaction they see fr receive from people when they first meet them. Going through a difficult emotional time that you don't feel comfortable talking to others about, call my mother. Have a parent that walked out on you, call my mother. Is your romantic relationship falling apart? Call my mother. <laughs> Did you just get diagnosed with cancer? Call my mother. Car, plane, phone, computer, whatever it is. If you have a relationship with my mom, she will always be there for you. She has no limit to the amount of time she will open her heart and make room for another to take comfort in the softness of her compassion. Mom, you are a beautiful soul. I am forever grateful to you for the life that you've given me, and I cannot wait to see what amazing things that you do in this new chapter of your life. I'm so proud of you. My parents have been empty nesters for the last three years, and now they are finally flying away from our nest to build one of their own. After 25 years of making sure this one was as nurturing and loving, as safe as it could be, they're now taking the opportunity to stretch their wings and take flight, and I could not be more proud. <laughs> Whenever we leave a social gathering, with any of you people, <laughs> I can always tell if my dad has had a great time because he'll say, so-and-so are such great people. <laughs> it's... <laughs> 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 it's so great to be around good people. <laughs> so mommy and daddy dearest, to that point I would like to say, Robin and Sarah are such great people. It's so great to be raised by good people. <laughs> I know I was not the only one grabbing a drink and chugging it to stop crying. That was beautiful, Chantel. I feel really bad for the next roaster. <laughs> but George, come follow that up. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, shit. <laughs> How do you follow that up? Yeah, I appreciate it. It's great. First, she steals my uh, Colonel Sanders joke. <laughs> and now this. Perfect. I will say, though, with the dunce cap on, it does kind of look like a mix between Colonel Sanders and Merlin from Sword in the Stone. <laughs> this is one of my favorite cartoons, by the way. So, I will admit, I did not sign up for this. My wife signed me up. I'm not very good at roasting because unlike Peter, I'm not a dick. <laughs> but I'll do my best. So I'm gonna start off with dad. Actually, no, I'm gonna back this up. You hold on to that, okay? You just think about this for a minute. I'm gonna start off with Ian. So, when I got out of college, my very first job was working for Rob at Worldwide Brands. And that's where I met Ian. And they introduced us, and I ate lunch with him a couple times, and I thought, this dude's pretty cool. So I'm gonna start hanging out with him, you know, and we did. We'd eat lunch almost every day. Unknown to me until like two years later, me and Ian are chilling one day, and he's like, you know, dude, when I first met you, I thought you were a dick. And I was like, <laughs> What the fuck, man? No one's ever thought I was a dick. How do you think I was a dick? He goes, no, you're not a dick, you're great, but when I first met you, I thought you were a dick. You just stroll into work like you freaking knew everybody and you're all this like happy-go-lucky guy and I'm like, well, shit, sorry, man, my, my bad. I'll, I'll try not to be so happy next time I meet somebody. So, uh, didn't think that we would ever have that kind of relationship when I first met him, but Ian, you are by far one of the most important people in my life. I want to apologize, because we, we live in Tampa now, which is not that far away, but I am horrible at keeping in touch with you. I blame it on my kids, they keep me pretty busy, so I'm gonna stick with that, but it really, <laughs> really isn't a good excuse, man. I love you, and you have been one of the most incredible people in my life, and I just am very blessed to have you, and thank you for accepting me, even though you thought I was a dick. <laughs> All right, on to Dad. So the only time I've ever been out of the country is on a project with Les when we go to the Cayman Islands. Now, like Peter said, no one tells a dick joke <laughs> like Dad. So I, uh, we get there, and we get to the hotel, and we're talking about you know, the plan for putting this massive project together that we've been working on for months. And all of a sudden, Dad's like, ah! And he, I'm like looking at him, he's like, oh my god! And he like falls over on the bed, and he's like, my leg, ah! And I'm like, <laughs> He's like, oh, I just robbed my leg. I won't stop. Ah. And I'm like, oh, you better not be fucking with me, man. And he's like, no, I can't. I'm like, so I'm like, I start like massaging his leg out. I'm like, I know this is going to be some dick joke. He's going to get me for the rest of my life. He's going to be like, you tried to rub my dick. And I'm like, ah. Oh. So anyway, long story short, cramp went away. Thank God. He was being for real. It wasn't a dick joke, but it still was kind of traumatized for me because I it was this roller coaster of emotions. Like, I want to help the guy, but I don't trust him because I've heard his dick joke so many times and I'm going to be the brunt of it. Anyway, Dad, I would rub the inside of your leg over and over again for you because I love you that much. He's a dick. Hey, what do you know, Peter? I guess I am a dick after all, eh? All right, so when I got, got here today, I saw Peter, and I was like, this old, like, grown-up guy looks like Peter. Holy shit, that is Peter. <laughs> Sweet tats, by the way, I like it. I like it. It's a good look on you, man. You're a very handsome young fellow. Chantel, you're beautiful. Robert Sarah, I got to say, you know, you ever had, like, the phenomenon where you have, like, two ugly people that have really beautiful children? <laughs> Well, I just want to say that sometimes life isn't fair because two beautiful people had two beautiful kids. So, you know, it's not right. I think my kids are pretty beautiful. My wife is, but unfortunately I can't claim the same. So anyway, Rob, I just want to thank you because like I said, my first job out of college was working for Rob and his mentorship is just incredible. Well, I've been working on a uh, business plan for a cafe for uh, about a year before um, I started working for him. And a couple months into the job, I got the phone call uh, from Full Sail. They wanted me to open this cafe up. Uh, I, I presented my business plan to them. And I was like, how am I going to tell Rob? Like, 
I, I like remember going into his office and sitting down at his desk and be like, man, I, you know, I, dude, I got to go do this cafe thing. Like he kind of knew about it, and, but he was like, I'll never forget him. He goes, George, win, lose, or draw, if you don't do this, you're going to regret it for the rest of your life. So I went in thinking I was going to let this guy down because I had just started. He invested so much time in me and mentoring me. And he did quite the opposite. It was like, don't worry about all this, man. We got it. Go do your thing. And um, lucky for me, our relationship at that point was more than just business. Um, I'd come over to the house all the time with Ian. And unlike you know, Peter and Chantel, you were their kids. They couldn't get rid of you. They were stuck. They actually <laughs> let me come over and hang out with the family. So that was a choice. Not, you know. um, but really, I mean, we would, I was there literally almost every day with Ian. And for Sarah, okay, we got, well, I say we got a boat. It really wasn't us. It was Rob that got the boat. <laughs> but we used it more than Rob did, so it really kind of was our boat. So me and Ian would go out on the boat all the time, and it was a sweet red boat with, like, gray on it, you know, whatever. But Ian was like, you, we should call it the Red Rocket. <laughs> and I was like, rockets are fast. That sounds great. Now, we told Sarah that it was called the Red Rocket. She's like, that's a really cool name for a boat. And I was like, can we put it on the side of the boat? And Sarah's like, yeah, I don't see why not. <laughs> Well, I'm pretty sure by the look on Sarah's face, she knows what Red Rocket means now. But for any of you that don't know what Red Rocket means, it's a dog's penis. So we never did put it on the side of the boat, but we probably should have, because that would have been great going around the lake. You want to ride on my Red Rocket? Let's go. So, all right. So on to some more serious notes. Um, Rob invited me one time to a drum circle at the house. But I don't play drums, I play the harp. I really do play the harp. But I was like, Rob, it's a drum circle. It's not a, not a harp circle. But I will say, that is probably one of the coolest nights of my life playing music, just jamming out with people. And it was a simple night, nothing crazy, but it's something I'll never forget. That and your awesome parties too. The 80s theme party. I, Rob said I could come to the party, but I had to dress up as boy George. <laughs> I was like, fuck it. I guess, my name is George. <laughs> sure, why not? Ended up being one of the best parties I've ever been to in my life to this day, man. It was great. And I'm going to miss those times. And I'm jealous that now London gets to have all the fun parties with you. But we're going to come over and visit. So, Sarah, you are amazing. Um, she's heard plenty of my sob stories before and had sat and even cried with me. And I thought that was really sweet when I really needed it. Um, you guys, seriously, like, I considered you for a long time as my Orlando family. I'm a, I grew up, I was homeschooled, so that'll tell you how close I am to my family in Tampa. Um, but you guys, I felt like, kind of adopted me, which really, I guess they do to everybody. It's just incredible when you walk into a home and you just know you're welcome, never question it. And you guys, by far... Um, were the most important thing that ever happened to me here in Orlando. And I'm proud to say now I don't consider them my Orlando family. I consider them my family. And I love you very, very much. Um, no matter how much time passes, when I found out you were moving to London, I was really kind of sad. But now it's like, well, we haven't seen him in like almost two years anyway. So what's the difference? <laughs> now we get to go to London when we see him. So, um, But it's just incredible, really, how you can go so long without seeing somebody. And when you hug them, it's like zero time has passed. And um, Unlike this speech, so I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up. Thank you. Long-winded. My bad. I love you guys very much. I wish the best for you. Travel safe. And one last thing, I to show you how close they are to me. My wife and I, we've known each other our whole life. She was living in D.C. I flew her down uh, to spend time with me, and I decided I really wanted her to be a part of my life, like long-term, forever. And so the very first thing I did when she came down, I was like, I got to introduce you to my family. And she's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, no, my, my other family. <laughs> and so the very first date I ever officially took my wife on was at the Cowie House. <laughs> and the rest is history. Uh, thank you, guys. I love you. Thank you, boy George, the only man who uses his finger to tell us what a 
<laughs> Red Rocket is. Um, all right, really quick, we're going to get Rachel over here for a real quick love note. Well, about 17 years ago, um, my son and Peter were in preschool. And for any of you that have uh, three and four and five-year-olds, you know that there's the birthday party circuit. It's either Chuck E. Cheese, a bowling alley, the Science Center. And some of my, my ex and I used to draw straws about, you know, who was going to have to go, go through the horror that weekend. So I, I drew the short straw, and uh, I show up at Chuck E. Cheese, and it was the same old faces. And then all of a sudden, there's Rob. There's Rob sitting in the corner. You, you obviously got the short straw that week, too. Um, <laughs> But I'm like, oh, fresh meat, fresh birthday party meat. I'll go talk to him. And so we get, it was around Halloween, and we got to talking about Halloween Horror Nights. And he said, oh, you're taking Zach to Halloween Horror Nights. And I'm thinking, he's four, you know? Like, what type of freak takes his son to Halloween Horror Nights? Um, so he gets, so he's like, yeah, Peter's a little afraid, too. I think I'll probably wait a year or two. He said, um, I have this mask in my garage. From a, from a movie I did, I have this prop, and it scares him, and he has nightmares, and so now I'm intrigued, and I said, you know, well, what type of prop, or what type of, you know, what type of movie? He said, oh, I, you know, I did a movie a few years back, and he's real humble about it, and he's just, it kind of was like a throwaway, and so I'm like real condescending, like, is it anything I've ever heard of? Um, <laughs> and it comes up, and he's like, you know, yeah, it was Blair Witch. I'm like, oh, yeah, I have heard of that. Um, <laughs> So we get to talking about a month or two rolls around and we've seen each other at a couple birthday parties and um, I said, hey, I said, I'm having a, a holiday party. Do you and Sarah want to come? He's like, sure, I'm up for a party. Well, uh, we had an annual party that was an S&M party. <laughs> Santa and menorah party. <laughs> but it was a naughty or nice theme. Well, I was so embarrassed because I had just met him and so I might have left out the part that it was naughty or nice because I didn't want him to not show up. So he brings Sarah, I meet Sarah for the first time, and they're bringing this big old box. And so between, you know, glow-in-the-dark vibrators and, you know, <laughs> vibrating underwear, he brings out this, this movie prop, which was ultra cool, but all the rest of my friends are like, what type of fetish is that? You know? <laughs> uh, next year, I think you guys did bring a blow-up sheep, so you redeemed yourself. Um, little did I know there was talk of red rockets and dick jokes every other time. I, I, I would have, you know, definitely told you that it was a naughty or nice party. But uh, fast forward 17 years, um, Rob, that fateful meeting at Chuck E. Cheese, you provided my son with a best friend. You provided Sarah the heart with arms. <laughs> um, and I just, I'm going to miss you guys. Love you. All right, and for our last roaster of the evening before Les closes out the show is our Orlando Story Club host, Bobby Wesley. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Bobby Wesley, um, and I am very good at this. Um, <laughs> but I, I want to come cleared with you all right out of the gate. Um, I, tonight, am incredibly hungover. Um, but that actually works out because uh, as I've gotten older, I'm finding that my hangovers are actually a lot like Rob Cowie's stories. <laughs> they're, they're getting longer and longer, and they're fucking brutal to live through. Um, so, uh, but I, I gotta say, uh, all the earlier talks tonight, a lot of people have said a lot of nice things. We've learned some great stories about Rob, and that shit ends now. I want you all to know. Um, uh, Sarah, I, I will say, Sarah, I was gonna roast you, but honestly, I don't have the heart because you have suffered enough. <laughs> uh, but, but I will say, uh, honestly, tonight, seeing how attractive both of your children are, and seeing how busted Rob is as a person, <laughs> If you want to come clean about anything tonight, about your history, this is a very loving and supporting room, so we're open for it. Um, and, and while, while I'm on the phone, uh, uh, Chantel, um, why haven't you responded to any of my DMs? Um, not, not a single one. I'm, I'm starting to take it. No, so uh, for all of you who don't get that joke, uh, DMs are direct messages, and in that bit, I'm a creepy internet personality. I'm not in real life. I'm actually here to seduce Peter. Um, 
uh, be, because honestly, his speech was very funny, and I, I find that incredibly attractive. So you just let me know. Um, no, that's joke. I'm, I'm not. I'm not here to, to, to sleep with with any of their children. I'm actually. I'm. I'm, I'm truly here for less. Um, now, uh, L L Les and I don't know each other particularly well, uh, but I've heard him uh, tell many stories, some of which he's gone on and on and on. And then at the end, he tells you that the whole story, he was just making it up the whole time. He was just pulling your leg. So I don't mean to be the spoiler alert here, but whatever this guy comes up with next is complete and utter bullshit. So any story, just assume opposite is the true story and you'll be good to go. Um, and and S Simon, man, uh, EA Sports, you were correct. No one knows who you are here, but that's okay. Like two people have ever heard of me also, so we're in good shape. But I gotta say, like, it's amazing that you're a technical whatever for EA Sport, because man, you look like a guy who's never seen a sport before. <laughs> You're, you're like you're like every insufferable hipster that someone asked about like the score last night. You're like sports ball. Like yeah, we've all heard the bit before, bro. We get it. Yeah, uh, but <laughs> um, but yes. Uh, uh, again, I am. Uh, well, actually, hold on. But, but not enough people have really commented on this whole situation. Like this 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 um, this midlife crisis beard that's been happening over the last six months. I mean, so, like, honestly, you, you look like you're going for the professor look, but, like, you only teach Wes Anderson movies because, like, you just don't understand his vision, his color and framing, man. Like, you don't understand. You're like if Mr. Potato Head got an art degree. That's what you look like right now. Um... But, but it is very true, I, 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 I along with Danielle, I took over uh, hosting Orlando Story Club back when Rob decided to get a real job. Um, uh, Sarah, you're welcome. Um, and, and, and Danielle is right, ever since Rob has left, the show has gotten better and better and better. The crowds are building and building. And I honestly, like, uh, like you all know, I'm very charming and very good at this. So this is not uh, uh, to argue with, but I honestly credit all the crowds to Danielle's this. Just wait. It's, it's, it's not because of her bright personality and her sparkling demeanor. It's because of her, un, her wild activity on social dating apps that our crowds have been filled with, with sad, horny nerds that are just hoping, hoping beyond hope that they're going to have a chance with this sparkling beauty. Um, so thank you for packing the house five dollars at a time with some real sexually frustrated dorks. Yeah. No, I love it. I love it. Yeah. You, you, you would have, you would have like, made a killing off of like teenage me. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, we're on board here. Um, uh, but no, so I'm, I'm, we're here to, to, to see Rob off. I'm mostly just here to confirm that he's actually leaving. Um, so that after the last three years of hosting this event, I can finally tell all the adorable little old ladies who come to my event and say, where's Rob? That he's not fucking here! You're stuck with me! It's fine. It's fine. I'm not Rob, but I'm all right. I'm all right. Uh, but no, seriously, it, it's, it's, it's going to be weird, Rob, though, like even being in London, ours, a uh, different continent even, world apart, that Barbara Hartley of Downtown Arts District is still going to be referring media calls to you. Again, like, uh, I, I know th this is a very insight, but Rob is still getting quoted in the Sentinel. I'll see like, oh, Orlando Story Club got a story in the Sentinel, and Rob Cowie is the lead... <laughs> You don't host the event, man. It's not your thing anymore. I mean, as much as you're getting celebrated for a thing that you did way back in the past, you'd think Orlando Story Club was the Blair Witch Project. <laughs> I didn't know it was possible to ride your own coattails. Uh, you're why I drink. But, uh, but as a result of hosting the last few years, I've heard a lot of Rob's stories when he's in town or bored or Sarah's had enough of him. Um, but, and so, so we always give him the stage because we respect our elders. Um, and every Rob Cowie story is clearly just an excuse to do some accent that quite frankly, I don't think is wholly appropriate that he should be doing that accent. Like, like Rob, I know you're from Africa and all, but like not that. I mean, it, like, sometimes, man, that joke was for me and I don't care that you didn't like it. It's fine. Um, no, you actually grew up in like, I mean, you kind of grew up in like Marietta and, and I, I, I'm, I'm a Georgia boy, and but Bubba, we don't talk like that, you know? Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know where y'all are from, but you ain't from around here, you know? Um, 
Okay, but so uh, my, 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 favorite, my favorite terrible thing that Rob has ever done to me um, was, uh, Barbara brought it up earlier, uh, we, we, we do a, a show at Fringe, uh, we do a, a free show, much like our regular show, where we just feature storytellers that are sharing real stories from their life, and we like to reward some great storytellers and bring it to Fringe to promote it, and honestly, this has kind of been like a, a running story called Advertisement, so thank you all for coming. January, yeah. January 29th, we're doing a thing with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Central, Central Florida, Florida Composers. Florida. We're doing storytellers with, uh, with, with a quintet. It's going to be awesome. February 5th is our next event. Come, because you're basically obligated. Um, but so at Fringe, we bring it to the masses, and it's lovely. Um, and so uh, the last time we did it, uh, Rob, or a year and a half ago, Rob came. He, we were like, Rob, we want you to close the show. You're our, you're our story daddy. Bring the heat. And so he said, okay, I'd love to do that. That'd be great. Uh, but I'm going to need like maybe more than the standard five minutes. I'm like, okay, well, again, story daddy, you get to do, you get a little, little leeway. Um, it's like, okay, uh, a couple of uh, five, six, seven, eight minutes at time. He's like, oh, it might be around 10, but that'll be fine. So he starts going and he's telling a story, beautiful love story of how they met and how they fell in love and how, how he wanted Sarah to be in his life forever. And it was lovely. And then it kept going because because Barbara spilled the beans a little bit. She was like, oh, well, Rob, he, he did this beautiful thing where he he told all of us how he wanted to renew his vows. I'm proposing again. I want to tell you how much I love you in the ways that I told you. I don't know, a thousand years ago. I don't know how old you are, Rob. You could be, you could be 28 or like, like 72. I have no idea how old you are. But like, so when, a million years ago when I told you that I loved you forever, I want to do that again today. So he brought a placard, a really large thing that was framed and matted, and it was too large, and it had like a 12-point bulletin of all of the things that he was going to say to his wife, his love, that he told her, these are the ways that I will love you every day, and you all said, ah, oh, but you weren't there. <laughs> so this, he went by point by point, which was essentially, a, a, it, was, uh, like, it was like a 12-point plan for how he's going to fail her as a husband every day. <laughs> And yet he went on and on through the whole thing, this, this, this well-intentioned but saccharine nonsense that I know you as the family have had to deal with your entire lives. <laughs> and Sarah, God bless you. you. We know you don't want to be pulled up on stage. And what did he do? Come on upstairs. We're gonna sit, I'm going to sit you on a chair so you can't leave. And I'm going to tell you bullet point by bullet point, like the world's worst TED Talk in front of, we packed the house, uh, like 150 strangers who were late to their next show. And so Peter was there holding this oversized prop uh, of, of, of a heartfelt nonsense. And, and, and Rob is reading them point by point. He's on his 17th minute now and we're late. So, so, so Peter is holding this thing and he wants to back away, but he can't. Sarah is, is handcuffed to a chair and she can't get away. The, the poetry guy who's hosting the next event, who is like, what the hell, man? He's trying to back away, but he, by the way, that guy, I see him around town, he asks me every time, what the fuck was with that story guy, man? <laughs> like, I mean, was, were they getting married again? That was a weird thing to do. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> So again, 1,100 minutes into, uh, into this thing, it was very lovely. We all applauded. It was beautiful. I recorded it. It's taking up too much space on my phone. I got to give it to you. Um, but it, it, was, it was a beautiful thing. Uh, we appreciate you did it, but never again. I'm glad you yeah, never, never, never again. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I, think, I think that's, I, I feel really good. I feel really good about our relationship. Um, you're a lovely human being. I got a, this was a really good therapy for me. And um, thank you for the beers that have leveled out my hangover. That's actually been really helpful for these too. Um, but um, but I, I got to say, um, I, I literally wrote at the end of these notes, um, say nice things, because I feel like that's the way I should wrap it up. And it's really hard. It's really hard to say nice things. It's really hard to say nice things. Uh, but I'm going to try anyway. Uh, Rob, I, I generally do appreciate you as a human being. Uh, you started uh, a storytelling event that we, we hold dear and has really brought people together in this community. And we're... We're proud and honored to be stewards of that. And uh, it, it, every time we introduce a new person and I get to say, we have a first time storyteller tonight. They came out of the hat. We drew their name out of the hat. And it's a person, a voice in this community that may have never gotten up stage, on stage before. And they're now sharing their voice with, uh, with hundreds of people and thousands online. It's a beautiful thing. And we wouldn't have that if you didn't start it. So thank you very much for doing that. And more importantly, uh, thank you for the rest of the family 
you've done the real work here. Um, but, uh, but, but I, I, uh, Rob, sorry, I love you guys dearly. Uh, uh, brother and sister, I'm gonna date one of you, definitely, by the end of this. Um, and, and, and He'll try to date both yeah. of you, I'm warning you yeah. now. And Les is gonna bring home, but uh, anyway, love you all, best of luck, and I can't wait to visit you in London, so yes. cheers. All right, thank you, Bobby Wesley. Now we're gonna have the second man of the hour, Les Cowie, close out the show with a champagne toast. <laughs> Okay, um, Robin, uh, th this is a good news and a bad news story. The bad news is that I've got like 20 points here of stories that I wanted to tell. Uh, the good news is that in respect of time tonight, <laughs> we've run out of time. But uh, there are a couple of things that I do want to say very sincerely. And Robin has been a storyteller all his life. But the story that he has told, the story that he has created with family, the story that he has created with his children, the story that he's created with his friends, and the story that he has created in business has been but the most remarkable thing for me as a father to appreciate and enjoy. Um, there were lots of stories about his childhood I was going to tell you about his high school, what he was like as a child and growing up and some of the outrageously naughty uh, things that he had done. <laughs> Even to the point of when he got to UCF and decided he was going to make his own movie and he wrote and directed and produced its relative. And not only did he learn how to make a movie, he learned the meaning of the director's couch and that's when Sarah came into our lives. <laughs> But what is a father, what, what, is a, what is a father has been just such a joy for me is to just watch the marriage, which has been just a phenomenal story as you've heard from some of the other storytellers tonight. But I want to thank Sarah for being the most amazing wife to my son. And also on a little bit of a sad note, because I believe Fran is here watching and sharing in the joy at this moment, but I want to tell you that no father could ever have expected from a daughter-in-law what Sarah did for my wife in the last two months of her, her passing from cancer. I never ever expected. They moved into our home. She took care of Fran and Fran passed with the most incredible love. And, and I will never ever forget that to my dying day. And Sarah, I thank you for that. I thank you what you've done for Robin. And I thank you for how you picked up for Fran and taught me quick books. <laughs> um, and so, and so you all have in front of you your, your glass, and I would like, to, I would like us to raise the, these glasses in, in a toast. Robin has always wanted to follow his passion. The two of them have always wanted to explore the world, and they now have this moment to go and start a whole new, fresh life. And it is but the most exciting thing, and. I know that I speak for all of you when we wish them success, yeah. and I'd like you to toast them now and wish them bon voyage. Bon voyage. To Robin and Sarah. And by special request, since we are gonna celebrate with some birthday cake, there is this Cowie tradition <laughs> that some of you know, and the birthday song goes like this. Moo, 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 Robin Cowie. I'm moo, 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 moo to you and many moo. Happy birthday, Robin. The 
Did I miss something? <laughs> Sarah, can you hold us for a minute? All right, I'm gonna keep it short. Anyone fucking believe that? <laughs> All right, you gotta start with me doing this. Everybody hold up their hands. All right, I keep them holding. People who have only known Sarah and I for one year, put your hands down. People who have known Sarah and I longer than five years, put your hands down. Yeah, it was short, shorter than five, shorter. It, she's the mathematician, okay? Shorter than five years, shorter than five. We're gonna go to 10, 10 years. If you've loaned me longer than 10 years. Fif 15, shorter than 15. 15, we're at 15. 20. 20, more than 20. Look how many more than 20. 30, if you've known me more than 30 years. More than 30 years. More than 30. 40, I'm at 40, I'm at 40. I'm at 40. Look here, I'm at 40. All right, 50. I'm not 50 yet, y'all. Fuck you guys. Fuck you guys! I'm not fucking 50, all right? I don't want to hear all this shit. I fucking think I'm dying or something. I wanted to have a party, not a fucking love fest. All right, am I getting a face slapping? Is that what's going on? All right, I want to talk about my biggest uh, mistake. Sarah did tell me the rubber was, was good. It was fine. She swore that it was good. She swore she was having, like, uh, you know, pills and shit. <laughs> It was all lies. <laughs> I gotta talk here, babe. All right, so, so um, yeah, my greatest mistake turned out to be possibly my biggest love. You inspire me every day, Chantel. You're amazing. And then there was Peter. We thought he was the good kid. They told me, you get one fucked up, you get one good. How the, f the hell happened there? Straight two zeros? I mean, you know, no wonder I look like I'm 100. He ended up being the bad kid. His girlfriend was down here the other day and like, they hated him. They hated him. Well, it was because of the tattoos. I warned him about the tattoos, though. I warned him about that. But actually, I love his tattoos. <laughs> I gave him so much shit about those tattoos, but do you know how much I love them? I'm, I love those tattoos, Peter. They're beautiful. And, and they started with... They started a tribute to my, to my mom. And you guys, yeah, my mom's dead. So you might think that sucks. But I gotta tell you, if there's anything good that happened in the room tonight, it came from my mom. And then there's my dad. Handing out cake and forks. See, I'm getting the I'm getting the yolk of my own freaking roast. That's my wife for you. All right, I'm gonna wrap it up. This is my dad. Dad, 
There will not be a second that we are in the United Kingdom where I don't hear your voice in my head. <laughs> yeah, it might be the cell phone. Dad, I, I just, um, I'm so grateful for you bringing me to the United States of America. Um, every single human being that's in this room and, and so many more that couldn't make it into this room are, are so magical. Um, and I, I just, I love every single one of the people in this room. Um, I, one of my most recent friends um, is standing right there. Hold up, hold up your hand there. No, you're right there with the... There are brand new friends that I made, um, like, you know, so recently, and there's friends here that have been for almost 50 years. <laughs> and you guys are wonderful, and we're so grateful that you came tonight and that you shared your stories and you shared uh, your energy and you shared your love. I, I love you guys so much, Sarah and I. You, you are us. We, we take you with us wherever we go. And I love you all very, very, very much. And now the final one, my wife. Um, this, is, uh, this is all about partnership. I have a, a great friend in this room who said, um, if there's something positive, give it love and give it joy. Uh, if there's something negative, go to the positive and give that positive love. Honey, you be my positive. I've been your negative. <laughs> But that's how batteries work, so <laughs> it's science. It's just science. Sorry. We work good together. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, we got cake. Um, Merry, Merry, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Holidays. Love. Love Kwanzaa, got Kwanzaa over there. I, I, and Ramadan, thank you. We've got a very diverse crowd tonight. Very diverse. Um, love you guys all. And uh, I love, um, you know that uh, song that you sing at New Year's Eve where it's like, for where are old acquaintance we forgot. Okay, we're not gonna do that. Never mind. <laughs> No. Uh, all right. Here we go. It's over. Thank you guys so much. We're going to have some cake. And uh, thank you to all the people who uh, told stories and roasted. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Sorry. I have to say one more thank you to our wonderful host, Danielle. And the, and the Downtown Arts District and Story Club and Haani and everybody. You guys are, I mean, wow. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right. <laughs>